Hey there, ladies and gentlemen. Today we're going to start phase two of the Chunin exams. This one will stretch for several videos because of its complexity and my added tricks. There are a lot of things going on behind the scenes as well. As such, I'm adding length so we don't forget anything along the way. The Genin are given one hour before the start of phase two and are brought to the outskirts of the Forest of Death. The smarter teams start working on strategies as simple as how they to travel through such an ominous forest. Others simply try socializing amongst themselves. Karui, for example, attempts to insert herself into the gathering circle of Leaf Genin. She introduces herself as the up-and-coming prodigy of the village hidden in the clouds. This attempt at bragging is cut down immediately by Omoi. He asserts that she's nowhere close to such a thing. Calmly turning to her teammate, Karui casually walks up to him before grabbing him by the collar and throttling him. As the Leaf Genin see the lighter side of the Cloud Ninja and their circle opens up a little bit, Konkuro then steps in. Karui immediately stops attacking Omoi when she notices Konkuro approach. Her funny annoyance turns to hard suspicion and she rests a hand on the hilt of her sword. Her demeanor transforms completely when compared to how she approached the Leaf Genin. Konkuro tries to introduce himself, but he's already had a bad run-in with Team Kakashi. Both Leaf and Cloud passive-aggressively push him out of the circle. Dejected, Konkuro shrugs and walks back to Tamari and Gara. We get a few moments of whispering from Konkuro to his team. He tells them that they should specifically target the Cloud Ninja at the next chance they get. Gara eyes Omoi and Atsui as all three join to introduce themselves to the Leaf Genin. Looking back to Konkuro, he tells his brother to fight his own battles. Before instructions on their next phase begins, a Jonin hands out a data book to everyone that contains information about each other. They explain that these books are all the help they're going to get for the upcoming challenge. Skimming through the book, Sakura is shocked at how much information is shared about their potential opponents. Since she already knew about the Leaf Genin, she flips to the Sand Ninja. Not just techniques and tools, but even chakra natures are listed in the book. Sakura mumbles to Shikamaru beside her. She wonders why they would share so much information about potential enemies. Shikamaru nods in agreement, glancing between his page about Tamari and then at the girl herself. He never would have pegged her for a water type. Anko interrupts the whisperings of the Genin and their data books to explain the rules of the Forest of Death. The goal during this phase is to reach the tower at the center of the forest through any means possible, and they just have five days to do it. Though they discourage deadly violence, it isn't outright against the rules. However, if they reach the tower without first accomplishing their collection objective, they will be locked out. So what's their collection objective? As Anko asks this, a Jonin walks to each team and hands them a scroll. She explains that the scrolls are one of two kinds. Each team either has an Earth Scroll or a Heaven Scroll. The first assignment regarding these scrolls is to never open them. Their objective is to collect one of each scroll. The catch to this objective is that there is a third kind of scroll hidden within the forest itself. Hell scrolls are the third kind of scroll each team needs to find. She tells them that there are more than enough hell scrolls for each team to have one. They'll be battling each other to attain one type of scroll, and then battling their environment and dangers yet unknown for the other type of scroll. Beyond this cryptic information, the Genin are given no more help. Once a team attains all three scrolls, they are to make it to the center tower. After they've arrived at the tower, they can rest until all the teams have made it. On one hand, they need to be careful in the forest. On the other, the sooner they reach the tower with a finished mission, the more rested they'll be for what comes next. When Anko finishes this instruction, Jonin lead the teams to the forest's entrances. These entrances are equidistant from one another for equal opportunity. No one is given a countdown, and the gates just suddenly fly open. Some teams, like the sand, casually walk inside. Others, like the cloud, sprint in as fast as they can. They need only walk for 30 seconds before the outside world is vanished. Once within the depths of the forest, we get the usual introduction of crazy creatures. 
giant slugs and bugs, swamps, snakes, little things that go bump in the night. Within a few minutes of entering the forest, Team Guy is jumped by another team. Rock Lee is as shaky as he's ever been, so Kiba takes the lead so Eno can weave some ninjutsu. The attacking team are the Rain Ninja. Eno quickly throws out a water prison that's ineffective to their already laid genjutsu. She shouts to Kiba that she can't do ninjutsu until they cut through the genjutsu. Biting his thumb, Kiba throws down a summoning that brings forth three ninja dogs to sniff out their enemies with him. As those three dogs work in tandem with Ino, Kiba and Akamaru catch out one of the three rain ninja on his own. Akamaru runs around to flank the ninja as Kiba conjures pellets of rock to launch in a volley at him. When he tries to form some hand seals, Akamaru clamps down on his left arm. Before he can deal with the puppy, Kiba has closed the distance to stab a kunai into his right arm. Both arms injured, the rain ninja tries to escape to range. However, Kiba's specialty is close range combat, and once that distance is closed, it's nearly impossible to escape him. A quick combination of taijutsu drops the ninja to the ground and Kiba chokes him out. Simultaneous to this, his summoned dogs very quickly sniff out the real bodies of the rain ninja. Once found out, the dogs bite into the ninja, distracting them and dispelling any remaining genjutsu. Ino throws a wall of water to force them to keep a distance as they shake off the dogs. The closer of the two remaining ninja charges through the wave and walks right into her mind transfer jutsu. Her unconscious body falls into Rock Lee's arms as the possessed rain ninja turns to fight his comrade. Confused by the betrayal, the third ninja takes a purely defensive stance. Pulling kunai from his pack, Ino begins slashing at the third ninja. She distracts him for long enough that Kiba sneaks in behind and lands a hard kick to the side of his head. Ino gets him to then put her in a submission hold so she can release the jutsu. In no time flat, they've defeated the rain ninja, and they've attained two of the three scrolls they need. They made sure not to kill the ninja, but they will still pull their bodies to cover nonetheless. Kiba tells them that there are far more savage and sinister ninja in the world. His sisters tormented him with stories since he was a kid. Rock Lee insists that Genin probably aren't that dangerous. Ino remarks that maybe his sister was trying to scare him for the sake of scaring him. Several seconds pass before he realizes that she only seemed to tell him these stories whenever he was annoying her. So Ino pats him on the shoulder while he grieves his naivety. She tells him that the stories at least have some truth to them. Rock Lee tells them that he will take part in the next fight. However, both of them encourage him to rest for as long as needed. They wonder what kind of record they could break if they got to the center of the tower as an effectively two-man team. Lee is not humored by the thought. He does not want to succeed off the back of others. Meanwhile, Team Kakashi has been plunged into complete darkness. They're lucky to have Neji to guide them through the dark cavern they've fallen into. Just as with Team Guy, danger befell them minutes after Phase 2 began. While walking through an inconspicuous clearing, the ground turned to tar. Logs on either side, suspended by rope, came crashing down towards them. It was only through the combined efforts of Neji and Sasuke that they fell to apparent safety. Neji saw a cavern beneath, and Sasuke conjured a strong enough fireball to cave in the ground. Now, Neji led the other two blind ninja to safety. Much to Shikamaru's chagrin, Neji and Sasuke have immediately descended into arguments. They're fighting about who should rightly lead the group. Neji says he's the natural choice since he can see the danger coming well ahead of time. Sasuke discounts this, citing that they clearly just walked into a trap. If Sasuke wasn't there to help, Neji spotting the falling logs would have proved useless in actually escaping them. They don't need someone with selective perception to lead, instead they just need someone who's strong enough to. They get to a spot where Neji tells them to infuse chakra into their feet because there's a great cavern ahead. Sasuke tells Shikamaru not to. Neji's just doing this to demonstrate why he needs to be the leader. Shikamaru asks Neji to come to him and grabs hold of his wrist when he comes close. Then he's guided to Sasuke and systematically links them both in his shadow possession jutsu. Here, in the complete dark, his chakra is barely affected by the jutsu use. Now that they're locked to him, he tells them to stop bickering. Regardless of who has what abilities or how they performed in school, their genin now, officially recognized ninja, should never act so infantile. 
If they refuse to work together while the other is the leader, then Shikamaru will have to be the leader. After an odd silence, Neji and Sasuke both agree that he can lead. A little jarred, Shikamaru remarks that they agreed rather easily. He tells them that if they decide on him, then that's that. They can't fight anymore. Sasuke shakes his head, knowing only Neji can see him. He tells them both that he doesn't want to fight, but he's been told his whole life that Hyuga are scum. It's hard to break not just from expectations, but from something that's nearly instinctive. <sighs> Neji sighs. The Hyuga don't openly look down on the other clans, but behind the closed doors of the Hyuga mansion, they are referred to as the lesser clans. Neji also dislikes their haughty attitude, but like Sasuke, it's been instilled in him from a young age. Shikamaru literally facepalms. He smacks his forehead with his palm loud enough that both look in his general direction. He tells them that they were both top of class. They both hold incredible dojutsu whose perceptive abilities dwarf that of any normal human. And yet they're both blind to the fact that they both want the same thing. He points out to them that in the short term, they'll be shamed by their clans. But in the long term, if they can set aside these stupid differences, this team could make history. Nowhere in the books is there a Hyuga working with an Uchiha. They're on the precipice of great change. Great change that their families will never make, so they have to. Shikamaru also tells them that regardless of how much they argue, he's still going to try. They're making his life miserable every time they argue, but he'll push through the challenge. Sasuke nods, again, only something that Neji can see. He agrees, on his end at least, to stop the fighting. They're no longer in competition after all, they're in cooperation. Neji nods too, to two blind people. He's still stubbornly holding on to the false pride of his clan. He looks at Sasuke, who he can see clear as day even in darkness, and furls his brow. You gave me that energy bar, didn't you? He asks solemnly. Again, Sasuke nods silently. For Neji to make this step is to ask someone to walk through a brick wall. He's crippled by this ingrown superbia. Bringing a hand to his face, clutching at his head, Neji struggles in silence ignoring that Shikamaru has released them both already. Sasuke stammers for a moment. Blanketed by darkness leaves him feeling exposed and weak, naked even. His heart flutters with the admission he's trying to make. The duality of his home life versus his ninja life has left him splintered. Now he's being forced to make the choice to work with what his clan considers scum. If ever there was a time to make life-changing decisions, Maybe it's now. Sasuke tells them that he does not live for the Uchiha, but for the village. His family was killed in the massacre. What's left is a hollow shell that happens to go by the same name. He does not relish turning on his family, but he's not. For as long as his family is a part of the village, he will stand by them too. Neji still has a frog in his throat as he struggles to answer Sasuke's profound confession. After a very long silence, he finally conjures the courage to speak up. Sasuke, I am sorry for the loss of your family. I also live for the village, not my family. Sasuke nods at him again and lifts his arm. Meeting him halfway, Neji shakes his hand. Shikamaru laughs in celebration that they finally found common ground. The common ground is far heavier than he expected. However, Hopefully this will root them in a more honorable soil. With the greatest confessions off their chests, Neji admits his wrong. There is no great fall ahead, but he does see a path to light, to the surface. As soon as light hits their faces, kunai are raining down upon them. Spotting an opening in this rain with his Sharingan, Sasuke attempts to jump through it, but his feet have sunken into a quicksand jutsu. Neji whirls in place and scatters the jutsu, dispelling its effect. With the freedom, Sasuke runs into the reign of Kunai and weaves through them in an attempt to find the source. But the source meets him head on. As if destiny's answering his call, Akane Uchiha dashes from behind a tree and clashes directly with Sasuke. 
the reign of kunai stop and when neji and shikamaru emerge to help sasuke they are ambushed by a team of grass ninja sasuke tries to speak with akane who ignores any attempts and continues the onslaught hammering the point of his kunai into the loop of akane's sasuke rips downward and tears it out of akane's hand now unarmed, Sasuke ducks deftly between Akane's swings and locks onto his right primary arm. He quickly glances at his team who are outnumbered against some grass ninja. He doesn't want to hurt Akane, but simultaneously wonders why he's in the forest with the Genin. Is it possible that he was sent in to kill Sasuke? Escaping the hold, Akane shifts between several tiger and wolf strikes. Forced to drop the crane stance, Sasuke shifts to the fox stance to defend. Gripping Sasuke's hand, Akane utilizes it for the start of a fireball jutsu. Let's see who has the better fire! Akane shouts at him, leaping away to complete the jutsu. Mirroring his cousin, Sasuke jumps backward and forms the necessary seals for his own fireball. As he heaves a breath for the fireball, he remembers his promise to his team. He stands not for his family, but for the village. He needs to see Akane as an opponent that will fall like all the rest. Memories flash through him of his father teaching him the fireball, of Itachi helping him sharpen his use of it. Hatred boils through him of the surviving clanmates conniving for violent change. Searing heat scorches his insides as he thinks of the one responsible for killing his family. His incomplete Sharingan shifts and his fourth Tomo appears. Swelling and releasing, Sasuke bellows out the great dragon flame jutsu at his cousin. His own fireball is like a spear, impaling Akane's and is the clear winner in this competition. Blinded by the light of his own jutsu, Akane does not have time to raise guard against Sasuke's overwhelming victory. After the fire dissipates, Sasuke runs to Akane's side to make sure he's not dead. Rolling free from Akane's unconscious body is a hell scroll. I'm afraid I have to cut it short right there. But worry not, I'm not going to cut out any of the fights during the Chunin exams. What was missed today will be caught up on next time. This one was really fun for me to write from a visualization aspect. The idea of Team Kakashi being bound by darkness during one of the most real conversations I've yet covered in this rewrite was really neat. I also wanted to showcase Team Guy. They've practically only trained since the beginning of my rewrite. So I wanted their first major fight in the Chunin exams to show their worth. And it's not that the Rain Ninja were at all incapable. Instead, Team Guy has come a long way. With someone like Mike Guy training them, I can only guess that stamina and taijutsu would be the areas focused on the most. And all the focus he's put into Ino's mind transfer jutsu is going to show more and more why that was worthwhile. Before I reveal my hand, we must wait for next time. The sky's the limit.